Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is our Pathways of Politics event. It's sort of a Poli-Sci 395 uh, event where we get to talk to our students. So the students that are in this room have either interacted with me through Poli-Sci 395, which is our internship course at the USC Center for the Political Future, or they're either a part of our UNRU Associates or our, our Vote SC, which are two stu student organizations that are involved mm -hmm. with the Center for the Political Future. But I would like to introduce everyone to our two incredible panelists. Um, we have Donna Lucas, the CEO and President of Lucas Public Affairs, and we have Steve Semelian, the CEO of California Consulting. They're respectively a public affairs firm and a full service grant writing firm. Um, so that's what, sort of what they do, but I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. They'll be able to give you a little bit more about themselves better than I would. So um, Donna, we'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your history and your journey for the students that haven't met you yet. Ah, well, I hate to tell you, but I graduated 39 years ago last <laughs> week. I realized that date when I was talking to Cami. I'm like, wow, that's gone by fast. Uh, from USC with a degree in journalism, broadcast journalism, and um, went into the world of politics, mostly working on political campaigns. I worked for um, George Duke Majin, who was running for governor in 1982 and uh, subsequently won. And so that's what brought me to Sacramento. But today I'm the CEO and president of Lucas Public Affairs. And it's, we're a public affairs firm based in Sacramento. Our work is very uh, California centric. We like to describe our work at the intersection of policy, politics, and communications. And our clients are corporate clients, uh, government clients, and mission-driven clients. So we work pretty much across the board on issues. And this is my third firm. Uh, my first firm I sold to Omnicom, which is an international PR firm, and that was an interesting adventure. But this firm, um, really, the focus is I really wanted the work to be reflective of some of the work that I did in government, uh, specifically when I worked for governors, because you work really at that intersection of policy, politics, and communications, and you can really see moving the agenda. So um, briefly, without taking too much time, from my journey from USC, um, I went to work in Sacramento as a press secretary for Governor Duke Majin went on to work for President Bush, the elder, as a press secretary, came back to California and uh, ran campaigns. And I, I worked in the treasurer's office as a deputy treasurer and then ran political campaigns, both for candidates and then ultimately for initiatives. And uh, started a firm, sold it, was very happy working in the corporate world when Arnold Schwarzenegger got elected and uh, went back, which was supposed to be only for two months and ended up being two years as his uh, deputy chief of staff for policy and initiatives. So it meant doing a lot of the political uh, portfolio, but I was also Maria Shriver's chief of staff. Um, and so it was a great, wonderful experience. I love government and politics. And today I have the privilege of not only being the CEO of Lucas Public Affairs, but I also am the chair of the California Chamber of Commerce, which is the largest organization representing businesses and business interests. But I'm also the chair of College Futures Foundation, which is really looking at access and completion for underserved communities um, in, in higher education, as well as working with women's Alzheimer's, foster kids, and uh, the Scripps Institute of Oceanography on Climate. So I'm very, I get to deal with a lot of great issues, and I get to work with a phenomenal team of uh, people, including some of the students on the phone or graduates, recent graduates, because one of the key culture, uh, it, key values in our culture is mentorship and growth. And so that's, and that's something I learned coming out of USC and through my experience of working with people and through my internships when I was at USC. Awesome. Well, fight on because I'm also a USC grad. And I also love the HW anecdote because I went to his graduate school. So I'm like always about anything HW, but um, what about you, Steve? <laughs> Well, thanks, thanks, Nicole, and thank you, Cami. Cami does a great job running this program, uh, and really appreciate his leadership. And hi to my uh, longtime friend Donna. Honored to be on this panel with her. We've known each other for more years than either one of us will admit. I'll give just a brief background on my political involvement. I also started in 1982 on the Duke Mason campaign in a little bit different way. I was a 13-year-old growing up in LA and uh, volunteered 
started uh, working for the local Duke Mason campaign, staffing, uh, you know, booths and card tables outside of malls and walking precincts and registering voters and, and doing what you do when you're 13 and, you know, you're a, you're a volunteer and worked on a various number of campaigns after that as a volunteer, including uh, George H.W. Bush's campaign in, in 88 and in 92. Both of those I was actively involved with. I was the state youth chair uh, in California in, in 88. I remember that very vividly. And then I was involved in, in 92 and then also involved uh, after that, uh, I went and ran a, a congressional office. I was district director for a congressman for eight years, uh, took a little bit of a hiatus from that job and uh, was co-chair of George W. Bush's campaign uh, in 2000. It would have been, yeah, it would have been two, 2000, right? And then went back to the congressional office ran for state assembly after that, was elected, served in the state legislature. And then after I left the legislature, opened up my own company, California Consulting Inc. We are a grant writing company where we uh, do not do lobbying, although we work with lobbyists. We work with lots of different folks from both sides of the aisle across the board in public affairs and many different uh, job, job duties. Uh, at California Consulting, we started in, in January of 2004 from scratch. We're now the largest grant writing firm in the state. We have 29 staff members. We have five offices and we've written uh, and had awarded more than $1.5 billion in grants for our clients. So we work primarily with cities, with school districts, with uh, community colleges, nonprofits, Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, several different organizations, but primarily our clients are cities and school districts. So that's, that's what we do at California Consulting. We're a grant, grant writing firm and uh, proud that we're the largest grant writing firm in the state. We have two USC interns coming in this summer that we're very, very excited about. Uh, I have a, a son that I have to mention because I'm a proud dad who is uh, a student at USC. And uh, I have another son who will be a student who's incoming at, uh, at USC. And I think they're the, we were calculating in our family the 18th and 19th or 19th and 20th, we're not sure, members of our family to go to USC. So uh, all of you who are USC students who are listening, you should be very proud. Uh, you are students at one of the finest academic institutions anywhere on the face of the earth and god knows it's very tough to get into <laughs> so happy happy to be here <laughs> thank you both so much yeah we love the trojan family um it's a great it's a great place, thing to be a part of but um just maybe to go back a little bit as well i know you both talked about sort of what you do now but i i'm sort of curious of what drew you to that career in politics so is there a specific moment where you was there like a campaign you were working on or something you were working with that really made you want to turn this into a career? Uh, how did you come about that? And uh, Steve, we can start with you this time. For me, I had a family that was involved. Uh, Donna knows, I think, uh, I'm sure. And so that was an attraction for me. I was like, okay, I'm going to get involved too. I started at a very young age as a volunteer. And then you just get the political bug. And, and once you get it, you know, you go from campaign to campaign and for those who are on the, on the call who are thinking about a career in politics, it can take you in many different you know, avenues. You can, you can go down the avenue of being a staffer, work your way up to being a chief of staff someday, either in DC on the Hill or in, in the state capitol. You can go down the path of being a political consultant. Uh, you can go down the path of being a lobbyist. You can run for office. You can run for office and then become a lobbyist. <laughs> there, you know, there's all sorts of ways to do it. Uh, Donna's in Sacramento, so I'm sure she can tell you uh, you know, how many staffers and uh, former legislators, former staffers and former legislators that are now lobbyists. So there's a number of different ways to do it. You know, for me, it was working on campaigns, then working uh, for the state party for a few years, then from there running a congressional office, and then going into, into my business as a, running a grant writing company. That was the path I took. Yeah, Donna? 
Mine was kind of interesting. My parents met in the state capitol in the 50s, and my dad was a reporter, and my mom worked for Helen Gahagan Douglas, who ran for the Senate and then worked in the Senate. And um, so I grew up in a political family, so I didn't want to go into politics. And um, I actually started my career as a publicist in the music industry. And I worked for Ozzy Osbourne, who I like to say prepared me for any politician I've ever worked for. Uh, and I realized very quickly that that wasn't what I, was, I wanted to do was to be a, a publicist in the entertainment industry. And um, when I was in college at USC, I was actually kidnapped at gunpoint and uh, not at USC, believe it or not, it was over on the West side. And I became very passionate about criminal justice issues. And, in the 80s, crime was a huge issue in California. It was the number one issue in public opinion polls. You know, today it's probably COVID or the economy or education. So um, I actually got involved uh, with, a, um, took a class from a guy named Joe Sorrell, who the Sorrell semester that you guys have at USC and we support in Sacramento. And he had a public affairs firm. And I became very intrigued with politics and he would have speakers like Willie Brown or you know people who worked in politics who came to Cal down to LA to talk about it. And so I went up to Sacramento on a um, three day program, which again, they still have and I really wanna encourage all of you to do it. And um, I just kind of got intrigued with Sacramento at that point in time. And so when the, the Ozzy Osbourne thing didn't work out, I said, you know, I'd like to work in politics. And I had a friend who said, you can volunteer to work for George Duke Majin on the campaign. And I wanted to work for George Duke Majin, even though my family was, uh, my dad was a big Democrat because, and George Duke Majin was a Republican. But one of the things that uh, the governor ran on was changing that law, that a law that would have, the, the guy who kidnapped me had, been, had committed violent crimes before, but had been out on parole. And it was a very controversial issue in the 80s about indeterminate sentencing versus determinate sentencing. And so I became very interested in the law and, and in advocating for change in the law. And uh, Duke Majin was running on that issue. So I volunteered to work on the campaign and subsequently became a press secretary for the governor. And at 22, literally, I graduated in May and in November was driving my beautiful Ford Escort up the five freeway to come work in the governor's office. And that doesn't normally happen. It was what Steve said, I volunteered. I just took a, a chance. I worked really hard. I loved the work. And, um, and I loved, you know, working for George Duke Majin, who, you know, was an amazing person. And so that's how I kind of got into it. From Ozzy Osbourne to George Duke Majin, that's a good <laughs> jump. <laughs> what a trajectory. <laughs> um, so I have another question about sort of an, on a similar vein of challenges that you may have faced. So, uh, I mean, you both have seasoned careers, so I'm sure that something has come up in, in the, your time. So what has been your biggest challenge and what did you learn from that experience? Mm -hmm. And Donna, you can start this time if you'd like. Well, I think it wasn't a challenge, it was an opportunity in the sense that when I started in politics, there weren't a lot of women in uh, politics and professional roles. So when I worked for Governor Duke Majin, there was one woman on the senior team uh, who was the scheduler. When I went back to work for Schwarzenegger, the majority of the senior team and the cabinet were women, which is interesting. And I think it's something very important. Uh, diversity in government is, you know, diversity everywhere is really pivotal. But um, I think, uh, one of the challenges I had early on was being a press secretary at 22, 25, uh, being the youngest person in the room, being a woman, a lot of times it was very difficult. And, and people say, oh yeah, you worked for a Republican. It must've been really hard. No, it wasn't my bosses. I had great bosses who were phenomenal mentors for my career. It was a lot of times the press corps, you know, that was at that time, mostly men and, um, you know, didn't, it was very hard to earn their respect and to have credibility as a press secretary. So I had to work very hard for that. And I think it made me um, uh, stronger in some ways. And it wasn't, it wasn't a conflict. It was more just how are you gonna demonstrate that you're bringing value or you have credibility. And part of that was being empowered by a governor and the, the senior team that gave me that opportunity. But I had to work twice as hard, I think, in a lot of times. And a lot of my colleagues, my male colleagues, I remember going into the governor's office and they all made, $10,000 more than me. And I remember being like, you know, crying about it. And my boss at the time, who Steve remembers, Larry Thomas, who was a 
big mentor of mine said, don't cry about it, do something about it. And so I worked, you know, I said, okay, I, I said, how do I get paid the same amount of money and do the same amount of work? And, you know, ultimately he said to me, one day, all those guys are going to work for you. And guess what? Half of them have worked for me at one point in time. So it worked out. <laughs> Amazing. Steve, what about you? Yeah, Donna is a trailblazer. And, you know, I knew her back. I knew her way back when, uh, before she was as famous as she is now, but she's really been a trailblazer. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we need more George Duke Masians in the political arena today. Uh, I'm not just saying that because uh, I'm a fan and we share the same Armenian heritage, but uh, he was a great leader that was someone uh, that was respected by both sides of the aisle, I think. Uh, he was a very, very good leader. I would say as far as a challenge, uh, similar to what Donna said about her, her gender, for me, it was, it was being young. Uh, it's great to be involved when you're young. Uh, and I encourage everybody on that's listening, get involved, uh, be a volunteer intern. You know, I have a lot of advice, a lot of advice on that. And it's all positive, uh, but it also is a challenge. Uh, you know, when I was at the state party in Burbank, which used to be the state party headquarters for all of California, uh, I was right out of college. I was 23. Uh, and people were looking at me like, you know, are, are you qualified for this job? How would you get this job? You know, who, who, who decided you're going to be here? And then a year and a half later, it's about a year and a half later, when I became district director for a congressman, uh, I was the youngest district director in the state. My boss said, you might be the youngest district director in the country. I was like, okay. And I remember that was a challenge. You know, people that I met with, um, we were in a district where I had to go on TV a lot because the, it's not, it wasn't like LA where there's 20 congressmen. You know, there's one congressman for, you know, 200, 150, 200 miles. So you're the main, you're the main show in town and you need to be on TV or on the radio speaking on behalf of your boss. And I was doing that in my, you know, mid 20s. And, and it was a challenge. People definitely looked at me a little bit differently. And the way to overcome it is just work hard and, you know, put your nose to the grindstone and, and learn. And, uh, and I tried my best to do that. So. Um, would you mind elaborating a little bit more about the importance of internships? I know you alluded to it, but um, why do you think they're so important? And do you think that practical experience is, especially as a, I, as a college student? I think it's critical, Nicole. Internships are critical. I encourage everyone to do uh, internships, not only in the summer, during the school year, if you can, if you can balance it with your school workload. Uh, they're critical. The, the, the lessons that are learned uh, as an intern, whether it's a congressional office, state assembly, state senate, it can even be you know private sector. It could be for an association, uh, a lobbying group, uh, uh, you know, an apartment association or a building industry association, chamber of commerce, which Donna is chair of, those internships are, are critical for gaining hands-on experience. Everything we learn academically in the academic world is fantastic, but there's not a replacement in my mind for the practicality and the hands-on ex experience of, be of being an intern. I interned in so many, I don't, in too many offices to be able to remember and I walked away from each one learning a lot. Yeah. What about you, Donna? Uh, on the vein of internships, uh, do you think it's important to do them uh, diverse different offices? Like if we're looking at, if, you're, if students don't know really what they're looking for, yeah. should we go nonprofit? Should they stick with just a public affairs firm? Like what, what is your advice on that? No, I think the more, when I was at USC, I think I did 13 internships. <laughs> I was one of those people who would like do two at one time. Um, I think it's important because you get to know what you like and what you don't like. And um, I think it's the number one thing to getting uh, into the job market. And I would tell you from an employer's perspective, it's critical for us. And we have an internship program. And I shared with you, Nicole, some, of, some links that might be helpful for the students. But um, we do an internship program and an apprenticeship program. An apprenticeship uh, is a little more senior after you've done an internship and you come in usually as a college graduate. But we have found we have recruited more people through that. Um, and it's a great way to, to really build your talent in that. And so, but I also think having that experience, especially if you could do six, you know, three months working for a member of Congress and then three months working for a PR firm or three months being a journalist. You know, journalism is how I came into politics. I was a journalism major 
And I think that's an important part of understanding the political process. So doing yeah. something in that capacity. And there are a lot of internships, um, paid internships. And that's one of the other things I think is really important so that you know all students can participate and be able to, to do it. So we pay our interns. I know a lot of other groups pay because it's, you know, you want them to be focused on that and not have to work three other jobs. Although I think it's always good to, I always look at the people who've had ex real job experience too, because I think that's yeah. important. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, I know we, for Poli-Sci 395, we partner with both of you. So thank you so much because we're very excited to be able to give the students those opportunities and connect with, with both of you. Um, Next so, Nicole, real quick, yeah. I wanted to mention, sorry. I, I should have mentioned in our congressional office, we hired we hired interns. So we'd have interns. And then when we had an opening, that was the first list I went to. Yeah. That, yeah. that, was, my, that was my list. I would go to, go to the congressman and say, this is who I think you should hire. And he'd say, well, okay, tell me about them. I'd say, they work for us. They interned for us for three months. I've seen their work firsthand. And he'd go, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I, actually, as a follow-up to that, we just got a student question um, that was sent to me. So I'm just going to ask you right now. I was going to wait till the end, but I like this. So um, they were wondering if either of you have found the Trojan family or USC connections or your personal connections useful in finding positions. Was Do you feel like it was mostly your personal connections that, that got you where you were, or was it sort of those experiences as well? And uh, Steve, you can start. The, the Trojan family alumni network has to be you know, number one or number two in, in, in the nation for colleges. So without question, there's no ambiguity. I don't think there's any argument that the Trojan Alumni Network is absolutely incredible and, and extremely helpful. Uh, also, in addition, yeah, for sure, your, your personal contacts, the relationships you develop uh, with individuals are going to be extremely helpful uh, to you uh, as an individual. And the example I just gave, you know, the people we hired in our congressional office, uh, they were hired. A lot of them were former interns of ours. Uh, it's very tough. As any, anyone knows, it's extremely difficult to get uh, hired in a state assembly, state senate, congressional, governor's office, U.S. Senate, uh, state treasurer, state control. I mean, those are jobs where the saying you have to know someone, uh, there's, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, the way to get to know someone, to build that interpersonal relationship that, that your student just asked about. Uh, internships is one way to do it. Proving yourself on a campaign as a volunteer is another way to do it. It's rare, not impossible, but it's rare that, that people get those jobs just off the street sending their resume in. Oh. What about you, Don? Anything to add? Yeah, I would say um, absolutely. I mean, my network through USC when I was graduating, working for Joe Sorrell, who was very politically connected and really stayed connected through my career and sent a lot of interns my way and, and students my way. Um, but I also think through other, there's other organizations too, besides, you know, academically, obviously the Institute and what just USC overall, there's so many amazing opportunities for internships. But also, um, and again, Nicole has some of this, uh, she shares or some of the other, the Capital Morning Report, which is a, a morning newsletter that goes out to everyone in the Capitol, but they have one section that just publishes for job opportunities. And they put all the internships in there. And I think what's interesting is given the virtual situation still, and I think people will still work virtually through the end of the year, that's a great opportunity if you're in LA and you want a Sacramento opportunity to, to do that. So. I, I think networking is one of the key things I would say. COVID put a little bit of a pause on that. I see students now who will reach out to me through LinkedIn, but you know, which I think is great and I think is a good way to do it. But I also think there's nothing wrong with, a, with a, an email, a personalized email. And I would really encourage you to do your research before you send an email to someone about what is the nature of their business or their clients or their history so you can connect in on that. But also, you know, like when a USC student sends me a note and says, I'm graduating from USC, this is my background, I immediately click in, oh yeah, I know that school through, through this or that. So I think it's important to do your research. Um, and also remember just about anyone you know had to start somewhere. You know, they had to get their first job, their first internship. So most people are pretty supportive of connecting in if you find a way to connect with them. You know, I think it's an important thing. Yeah. Um also, Donna, I sent the students all of the, 
the materials oh. that you sent. So they have them. They have them already. So um, if you, if any of you are hearing Donna allude to those, you have the materials. You want to click on those and follow along. But um, Nicole, sorry, Donna and yeah. mentioned Capital Morning Report. So when I my first week in the Capitol and I was working there, Donna, you'll you'll laugh. Uh, I was, I guess, naive, and I I got the Capital Morning Report on my desk. And all my staffers are telling me, you got to read that thing. And I said, what are you talking about? They said that at that, at that time, it would come in a fax, Donna. <laughs> yeah, right? I remember that. I remember that. <laughs> yeah, at that time. Yeah. So, so they're like, that's like the Bible of what you need to read. They said, before you have your coffee, before you open your computer, before you, you know, get going for your day, you stop everything and you read Capital Morning Report. So I'm like, hmm, okay, all right. <laughs> so I, I started good. reading Capital Morning Report every morning before I did anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that's good to know because that's what we're, where people can find all their opportunities, right? Um, so Donnie, you already mentioned a couple of the things that my next few questions will be. So this is mm -hmm. exciting. But um, so I'm gonna ask a question a little bit about mentorship. So uh, you alluded to it, Donna, how mentoring is important. And so I wanted to know, who were your mentors throughout your career and what impact did they have on your journey and what did you want out of, that, out of that relationship and then vice versa how do you I'm sure you're a mentor so how do you interact with your mentees um, what does that look like for you mm -hmm. that's a good question and I think you never stop having mentors even now I have mentors but um, uh, professionally mentors were my first boss Larry Thomas who was the press secretary for George Duke Majin a uh, corporate PR guy worked in politics and came back in the governor's office. And I really learned from, he took the time to really sit down and explain. I learned a lot about management from him and interaction. And also when you go to work at 22 in a governor's office, it's a pretty, it's like going to work in the White House. I mean, there's protocols, there's issues. And um, he, through my whole career, he was r really there. And it was both him and Steve Merksimer, who was the chief of staff, who's still a very close friend and still a good mentor. But later in my career, Maria Shriver, when I worked for her, um, I learned a lot from her. I, you know, the, she's just such a, uh, someone who's out there so publicly, but even privately, the things I learned from her, uh, just even how to treat people. You know, with, with someone like her, who's so, you know, so much going on, she, when she goes into a room and someone's talking to her, she's talking to that person. I learned that a lot. Um, I also learned from Joe Sorrell, who I'd mentioned earlier to you all, who had a was a teacher at USC, but had a public affairs firm. He taught me how to work a room, which is really, you know, you, you laugh about it and it's a really important thing. It's a skill set in our business. And it means in working a room, it's not to get anywhere, but how do you ensure you, you talk to people or connect with people? And, and um, so I think that was, you know, he was an important mentor in that. But there's also been other people through the course of my career who have really taken the time to teach me things that you, you wouldn't typically learn in some other places. And I really, really appreciated that. And I, and I think a lot, um, we have a program, again, Nicole, I gave the link to for a program called She Shares, which is a women's mentorship program. Although I invite any of the guys you can come to our programs, they're great. We're gonna have uh, Supervisor Holly Mitchell come and talk. And it's a program I started with um, two other women in Sacramento, specifically because we found that young women just starting in Sacramento didn't have a resource to kind of go to and ask some of these questions. And um, so what we do is we have a program in which we interview women who have, like the Chief Justice was just interviewed earlier this year, Holly Mitchell, Nadine Burke Harris, the Surgeon General. And we focus on how did they get to where they are? What were the skills they learned? And what's, what's some of the things that they can pass on to other folks? And in addition to that, we have a mentorship program. And so young women are paired with other, other women in the capital area. So they have someone that they can talk to who's necessarily at the office or work, but, but can serve as a, uh, a resource for them. And so it's been a really successful program. So I've sent that link. And the final thing I will just say is that um, we have a mentorship program in our own firm. And we have found during COVID it is imperative because connecting people. And, um, you know, I learned so much from my mentee, I learned more from her. I really enjoy spending time with her. She's a creative, she's our creative service specialist. Um, she's brilliant on everything. She designed this, this background I have right here. Um, but you know, it really helps me to stay in touch with what's going on in our firm. So we call it a circular mentorship because well, I'll talk to her about business or clients or how we're growing or 
doing different things. She'll teach me stuff that I would never have guessed before. So that's a long answer, sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. What about you, Steve? You know, I definitely have learned a lot from the people I've been fortunate enough to be around. Uh, listening, uh, especially uh, when I was young, super young, you know, 10, 15 years younger than everybody else I was around. Uh, it makes you listen and learn and realize, wow, I'm, you know, really privileged to be in this spot around these high end, you know, people and, and highly, you know, seasoned people. And, you know, I, I learned from Ed Rollins. I learned from Carlos Rodriguez. I learned from Dave Gilliard, people that Donna, I'm sure knows, uh, who are at the top of their game uh, in the political consulting world uh, when I was a kid. And I learned a lot from those individuals. And, and then as I moved on in my career, uh, I had an opportunity to work for Ariana Huffington for about almost two years and spend a lot of time with her, not just work for her, but you know, spend a lot of time with her in the car, driving to events, downtime, in between events. You can learn a lot from someone like that. And I did. And I, I uh, kept my ears wide open, so to speak, and uh, asked a lot of questions. And Ariana is one of the smartest people I've ever met, you know, whether you agree with her politically or don't agree with her politically, you know, first, first woman captain of the, I think it was the, the Cambridge debate team. I can't remember. I think it was, uh, I mean, she's quite an accomplished person. I learned, I learned a lot from her. And then in business, uh, when I got out of politics, I'd only ever worked in politics my whole life. So I didn't really, you know, candidly know anything about private sector or how to run a business or, you know, meet a payroll or hire employees or HR rules or anything like that. So I had a few mentors that helped me that were successful business people that answered a lot of my questions about, okay, you know, you, you've got all this political experience now. Business relates to politics, but it's different. You know, here's some do's and don'ts. Here's some best practices. Here's tips on everything from hiring to interviewing to, you know, running your budget of your company, which is obviously a big deal. So definitely learned a lot from some business uh, mentors who had been successful and, and come before me. And now uh, I try to work with a lot of young people. Uh, a lot of the, our team members in the company are young, uh, as well as uh, our interns and others. And just, I think what Donna said is very accurate. Not only do I impart knowledge upon them, but they teach me. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that they know uh, that I don't know. You know, they're teaching me, oh, you don't know how to do Instagram or you don't know how to do this or that. You know, here, here, you have to be able to do this or you have to be able to do that. I'm like, what? Huh? Yeah, so, so it, 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 it's a trading, kind of a sharing of information, a sharing of knowledge uh, it, it more than, than just me being a mentor to them. And of course, they ask a lot of questions, which I'm happy to answer, but I ask questions too, because there's things that they know that I don't know, so. Yeah, for sure. As a follow-up, how do you maintain those connections? So say you have this mentor-mentee mentee program, but, um, or you know something within your company, but what if it was, I, I guess I'm just trying to think of it in the vein of, for a student, say that they entered with you, but they moved on, and how do you maintain those connections that way? Uh, do you expect students to check in with you, or do you want that? Do you appreciate that? Is that something that you would like and you Steve you could start I would say yes to all of the above Nicole <laughs> yeah. Definitely. I like it when they keep in touch with me and many of them do uh, and it's advantageous for them and advantageous for me I mean I used to do it when I was in their shoes mm -hmm. I walked in those shoes and that's what I used to do when I ended an internship even if I interviewed and didn't get an internship I stayed in touch with that person yeah. I'm still interested you know I just finished this internship. I think I did really well. I got a letter of recommendation. Here it is. I know when, when you and I met, you know, you didn't have an opening for me. I'm still interested in your firm. I'm still interested in your company. I'm still interested in your, in your congressional office or your Senate office. Uh, so that communication, that's building your network. That's, you know, building your contacts. I often get asked, I'll, I'll kind of answer that and, and conclude that answer with this. I often get asked, can you introduce me to this person? Can you introduce me to that person? Finally, what I did is I put together a list of all the people that I know at all these different associations and lobbyists and political consultants and mayors and city managers and everybody. And I put them all on the list. That way I can access them quickly so that if, if someone comes to me and says, well, you know, who, who do you know at 
this place or that place, I don't have to think. Because at, if your network is big enough, and you know, I'm sure in Donna's case, it definitely is, you're gonna, you're gonna have a problem remembering like, oh, okay. And, they, and people switch jobs. You know, the person who was the government affairs director at Sony goes to be the government affairs director at, at uh, Walgreens. And the Walgreens government affairs director switches to go be the government affairs director at Mattel. And you know, they're, so you wanna keep your database up, up and you wanna keep your contacts current, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Donna? I think exactly that. And I love for people to stay in touch. And in fact, we were right before COVID, we were going to do an alumni event with all of our interns. Cause I went to one with my mentor. He had a, hosted an event, Larry Thomas, for all the people who ever worked for him or started their careers. Cause he thought it would be great for all of them to get to know each other, you know, and, and to network. So um, I think we also are going to think about doing an uh, alumni. We do a event, it's called Thirsty Thursday where we have a speaker come. And um, I just talked to our team about bringing a couple of our alumni back or interns who have moved on. Several of them work in the building now. And um, I think keeping that network is really key and, and important. But I, I think with students, yes. And I think, again, LinkedIn kind of helps a little bit, but I think also there's nothing wrong with an email or even with events. And so if you're in Sacramento, there's a lot of different opportunities when you're in person like the press club or PPIC or other events where people can come, it's open to everyone. And it's a great opportunity to network with, you know, with former um, students. But I think it's really key to keep people up to date on your network because it, it's, I love it. I just did this the other day, a young woman called me who just graduated from Santa Clara and I went to high school here in Sacramento at St. Francis. And I have a young woman who's been my mentee for years, who's now a senior VP at a PR firm. She went to St. Francis and she graduated from Santa Clara in communication, same thing. So being able to connect them, they had a lot in common. And, and that was a, a really kind of a cool thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we have you both because when thinking about a question about networking, it's, you know, students always hear about networking, but you don't take a class on it. You know, no one knows what networking really means or what it is. And so I really appreciate those those answers. Um, I think, yeah, LinkedIn is definitely a great tool for sure for this generation to be able to, you know, just shoot their shot <laughs> for lack of a better phrase. But you know, it's um, interesting. My business partner, Cassandra Pye, who's a phenomenal networker, teaches yeah. our tap, does a, a seminar for our team on how to network. And it's really interesting because there is an art. It, it's very purposeful and you need to be, you need to be purposeful about it, especially in the work that we do. Right. There, do you, there should there should be a class on how to work a room, Donna. Yeah. <laughs> a professor should come up with a class. And I, I mean, I first time I learned how to work a room, I was like, what is this? You know, yeah. the person, <laughs> you know, person is telling me, here's what you have to do. When you walk into the room, here's what you have to do. I'm like, wow, should I write this down? You know, should I be writing this down? <laughs> <laughs> and there really is a science. It's, an, it, it, it's not made up stuff. It's not stuff you're just, you know, pulling out of a hat. I mean, there's a way to do it. There's a, there's a, there's a way to do it. Mm -hmm. And I just yeah. saw a seminar on how to work a Zoom call. <laughs> I was like fascinated. And they said, you use the chat to directly chat to people, which always makes me nervous when I'm on a Zoom and chatting because I'm like, oh, am I going to send this to the whole Zoom call? You know? <laughs> but they, you know, they said, get a list of people who are on the Zoom call and then email them ahead of time. I was like, that's too much. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to know that uh, both of you are still you know, lifelong learners here when we're we yes. have both such easy season careers that I feel like we need to always remember that we're lifelong learners. Um, but I, uh, I wanted to open up the, the room if any students had any questions, uh, if you guys wanna raise your hand and then I can call on you or if you just wanna go ahead and ask, please go, please do. Mm -hmm. Chloe. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Chloe. I'm a rising senior at USC. Um, a lot of you talked about different strategies that helped you in your careers and building your pathway to politics. And I was wondering, not to be negative, what are some things that you've noticed that are like immediate turnoffs, either in your own experience or in interactions you've had with younger people? Either one of you can, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Anna. Um, Well, Steve, I can tell you. I, I think what you, for me, and I know Steve has come up through, you know, I started my political career in the 80s. Again, I came from a family. My dad was a Democrat. My mom was Republican. Public service was an honorable, 
career and you wanted to do public service. Um, I worked for George Duke Majin, but I had French friends on all sides of the aisle, you know, Democrats, Republicans. And um, so I think one of the turnoffs for me, Chloe, is I'm, I'm a huge believer in public service and I admire anyone who is going to put themselves or put their name on a ballot or is gonna put their time and their family out front. It's really hard work, or if you're a staffer. And so one of the turnoffs I've had is when people come in and they're very opinionated ahead of time or have already preconceived um, what, they're, what they're thinking about on different issues, whether it's a client issue or they'll come to Sacramento and they'll say something. I think it's really important to, to be open-minded. I think you absolutely have to have an opinion and I applaud people who have you know, political beliefs, believe me, I do too. But I also think what has really um, been an important part of my career is really having a relationships all around and understanding and listening to people on all sides of it. And I think lately it's been really hard and I know why. So I think it's a turn off if, if you have someone who's already preconceived in, the, in what they're saying. Um, so I would say that's one thing. And I say the other thing, and, and this is not a new generational thing because it was, I would remember going to interviews on my jobs and people said the same thing to me, but it's the entitlement. You know, I'm entitled to be in your office. I'm entitled to be X. I'm entitled, I should be this, I should be that. And that, you know, probably I see that about 10% of some of the candidates that I talk to, but that's a real turnoff to me because I, I love the people who want to come in and say, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I really want to work. I want to learn. That's a real turnoff. I mean, that's like, I want that person working for me. I want to second the motion from Donna. Donna, <laughs> you really articulated it well. I would say, I'm going to use the term arrogance. Uh, that's a turnoff for me. People who come in that are, even whether even if they are highly accomplished, even if they're you know in an elective office or a high level staffer, or if they're a job applicant, uh, you know what's a big turnoff? People who have that, Donna called it entitlement. I'll call it arrogance. Just kind of like I'm it. I'm here. You know I'm entitled to this. You have to do this. Yeah. I've always approached things. And I think the proper way, appropriate way to approach things is with humility, uh, being humble. Uh, it's better to come in and say, I'll do whatever needs to be done. You know, whatever you need me to do, I want to listen. I want to learn uh, and I want to work hard and I want to prove myself. And that that's the case if you're a congressman or that's the case if you're an intern, because either way, even if you're a congressman, you're still working for the people. You, you, know, you still have a job to do and it's an honorable public service job. Uh, so there isn't any reason to kind of have a chip on your shoulder about it. And so that for me, uh, I don't see it very often, but when I do, it's definitely a turnoff that uh, that level of uh, entitlement, Donna called it, I'll call it arrogance. And unfortunately, uh, Chloe, to answer your, your question, uh, I have seen that in politics, <laughs> probably more than I, I would like to have. I can't speak for Donna, but I think everybody who's been involved in politics, I'll say, has seen that at one point or another, you know, being an elected official or being a high level staffer. Very few and far between, but it does happen where uh, where they kind of got they get caught up in that. They get caught up in that. And it's a challenge because I think you have to have confidence. There's a difference between confidence and arrogance. And yes. um, and I think it's really important. We talk a lot about is you, you should have confidence, but having some humility or just like Steve was saying, you know, it, it is it's also an endearing characteristic when you're talking to people. Yeah. Thank you. Any other student questions? I have a write-in, but if someone has a uh, hand they want to raise, please do. Okay, I'll ask the write-in and we'll give them a minute. But um, so I have a student that asked, what is one story or experience from a past internship that you think has been instructive or important in your current career? And either one of you can start. From our internship or someone who was an intern who worked for us? I think either, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Very thought provoking. I'll, I'll start. <laughs> I'll start, Donna, if that's okay. So I had a boss one time. Uh, I, I just will say it was definitely, it was not the congressman I worked for. He was very humble. But I had a boss one time who, uh, learning experience for me, just kind of eye opening experience for me. Uh, the, the, the person was stuck. This is a great story. 
and, and 100 percent true the person was stuck on an airplane and uh it was uh, they were on the runway and it was ice it was ice and the, the uh air the pilot said you know we're not going to take off we just can't it's not safe and uh, the the person who was the boss was literally yelling at uh, uh the secretary uh in the office about you know you've got to get this plane to take off i don't care who you have to call what you have to do etc cetera, etc cetera. so the the person was obviously not able to do that so the boss said put steve on the phone steve will make it happen steve's a go-getter everything i ask he gets it done so she handed me the phone and i got on the phone and i said what's what's the problem what seems to be the problem and this person explained it to me and i said look we're not going to call the FAA to try to get to try to get your airplane, you know, lifted off. You're just going to have to deal with this. And the moment that it's clear and it's safe for all the other passengers, I promise you that the pilot's going to take off on the and the plane's going to take off. And and the person said, "Okay, if you say so, you know, hearing it from you, then then that's okay." I hung up and I thought, "Wow," I said, "That just kind of tells you." You know, some people are not grounded in the reality that they think they can get an airplane to take off <laughs> because, <laughs> when there's ice on the runway just because, you know, they are who they are. And so kind of a, one of those stories that sticks with you. This happened many, 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 many years ago, uh, but it stuck with me, obviously, or I wouldn't be talking about it right now. It's one of those ones that just raised your eyebrows a little bit. Donna? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we've had hundreds of interns through the firm, through both of my firms, but my last firm, we had a situation where an intern came in and took confidential information uh, for a client and used it in an office, went to work for the opponent. And, um, you know, I talked, I, we had to, it was horrible. Yeah. And because I'm a big believer that people should be in the room if they work with you. And obviously anything that's strictly confidential. But I remember being really shocked that they did this and I said confronted them and said well why would you do this and they said well you know you you know we're in politics and politics is very competitive and you do you know you got to do what you got to do to win and I was like whoa are we teaching <laughs> different values here so I think it's one of the things I learned very early on I think that we we instill that in our client and our interns that confidentiality is very important um you know, I think that person learned they, their career did not take off. I mean, they had a, a, other challenges through the career, but I think you have to remember with people just starting their career, you have to be very clear about things like that. So that, that was not a great situation, you know? Yeah. I, I have a story like that too. Unfortunately, Donna was not an intern, but former employee that took a job with a competitor and in their, in their final two weeks, went into the computer and just, you know, unfortunately did what you're talking about. And I don't know what goes through people's minds when they do that. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure what kind of ethical, you know, basis they have. I, and I, and I confronted him because our IT guy found it and brought it to me and said, these are all the files that were copied. And, and then the person used one of those cleaner, whatever they're called to try to cover their tracks. But our IT person was able to get to it. And I confronted him. I said, what are you, what are you doing? You know, you, you're going to go work for a competitor. You gave her two weeks notice. I said, good luck. Great. Go for it. Wish you the best of luck. You know, knock yourself out. Don't do this. This isn't a, this isn't a good look for, for anyone. You know, no one went from this kind of situation. Well, it's one of my big rules that people always ask me, what's your words of wisdom? Don't ever burn a bridge in Sacramento. I mean, what goes yeah. around comes around really here. We have six blocks that we all work and live within. And so, you know, it really is, you, you, it's your reputation is everything. And one of my other favorite lines is, you know, don't, don't represent a client, don't do something that you wouldn't want on the front page of the Sacramento Bee. And that's a, that's a very important guidelines for interns too. You know, would you, and it's, and it goes for, if you're asked by your employer to do something that you don't think is ethical, I think is important to always raise. Yeah, um, we have another write-in question. Um, so they would love, this person would love to hear some tips about working a room post pandemic and would that look different at all? <laughs> I love working rooms. This is my favorite. I miss <laughs> it so much, but I'll let Steve jump in, but I'll, I'll just give you three of my key things. Number one, know the room you're going into. Who's in the room? 
you know, sometimes if you know ahead of time who's in the room, you say, I really want to meet Steve Similian, who works for Congressman Joe Blow. So I'm going to go find him, you know, and, and say, Steve, I wanted to meet you. And I wanted to tell you, hello, it's nice to meet you. You know, <laughs> you always have your business cards available or a bit ability to, to follow up through connecting. Watch people when they're talking. Don't interrupt people's conversations. It's a real art to be able to introduce yourself without introducing, you know, interrupting something in that conversation. Why do you want to meet people? I mean, that's one of the other things. For me, a lot of times I've talked to people via Zoom for the last year and a half, and I want to meet them in person, you know, or I want to say hello because we have a, a similar client or a friend or someone like that. And the places you can go and work rooms, again, I'm sorry, Nicole, I keep referring to my list, but okay. I thought this would be helpful for you guys, especially if you're in Sacramento. PPIC has a lot of free venues. Um, these are Sacramento events, but I know in LA and other places, you know, the university has great events. So, you know, again, ask them ahead of time, who's in the room that, that I want to come and talk to? And in a, even if you don't know, I see so many people go to events now and they get on their phone and they just ignore until a program starts. Go up and talk to someone. Say, hello, hi, I'm, I'm Donna. I'm Donna Lucas. I'm here. I'm, I have a firm here in Sacramento. What brought you here? And, you know, people love to talk about themselves if you ask them to a certain point. If they don't want to talk about themselves, then move on. You know? But that's, <laughs> and you'll find you'll connect, you can connect with people very quickly on that. So I would just echo Donna's comments, you know, working a room, it, it, there's an art to it. And why are you there? If you're going to walk in and go to the corner of the room and, you know, look at your phone and answer texts or, you know, send messages or, or take pictures of the room and send it to your friends and say, I'm here. Why are you there? You know, what, what, was, what was the reason you're there? What did you gain from being there? What was the, what was the gain? You know, what was the value add if you're there? So, you know, we had three field reps that, that worked in the, in the congressional office. And I sat down with them when we hired them. I said, look, this is what you're going to do. And you get in a room, you take a stack of business cards. And when you come out of that room, hopefully you have no business cards left. You know, hopefully you are completely out. And also, we'd also like to see how many you collected. Because <laughs> it's not just about you giving them out. Because when you give them out, they may call you, they may not call you. But if you collect them, you're going to call those people and you're yeah. going to follow up and you're going to put them in your database and you're going to follow up with them. And they're now part of your network. So that was one of our rules is can you, we used to say, can you touch every person in the room? You know, are you able to, and by touch, we mean, yeah. are you able to get their card? Are you able to shake their hand? Are you able to give them your business card? And so that was a, a big part of being in the political arena was being able to work that room uh, sufficiently and comprehensively to be able to make contacts and walk out of that event. Like, okay, that was a good event. That event was worth me going to. I've got six new contacts or I've got eight new contacts. I, I think that we used to say, you come, don't come back unless you have three new contacts. But um, the other thing is going with someone who does know people in the room is also very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, knowing that, um, you know, I used to stand next to people, <laughs> my boss who knew everyone and I'd be like, oh, then I can meet that person or, or someone introduces you around. That's a very nice way to, to meet people too. Yeah. Chloe? Hi. Um, going off of contact building, just kind of adding to your network, what are your strategies in maintaining those relationships? Whether it's reaching out after a while or just checking in, how do you kind of go about that? Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. So. Uh, what Donna said earlier about not burning a bridge, Chloe, that's critical. It's imperative. Uh, you, you don't want to have a, a, an enemy, uh, especially in the small you know, group of, of being in politics. As big as California is, the political arena is small and everybody talks to each other. So not making an enemy, not burning a bridge is critical. And then having a favorable, positive relationship with the people you work with. You want the people that you work with to be able to walk away and say, I like her. I like him. You know, she's a good person. He's a good person. Mm -hmm. They're honest They're ethical. I may not agree with them on every single ideological issue. That's no problem. You know, try to find someone you agree with on every single ideological issue. It'd be pretty challenging. It, it's about liking the person because we all want to work with people we like. Right. Mm -hmm. So when you know you've achieved that, and I'm sure Donna can name a lot of people, and I'm going to use myself as an example. I can too. 
is when you can call someone that you haven't talked to in five or seven or 10 years and ask them for help with something and they'll immediately return your call and help you out. Mm -hmm. That means you really have a relationship. You have left a very positive impression with that person that you stayed out of touch for three years, five years, seven years, but something came across your desk and you say, oh, you know what? This is perfect for uh, this person. I need to call them. They can help my client with this or they can help me with this. And you call them and they call you right back and say, how can I help? Yeah. What can I do? I'm in. Tell me how I can help you. Chloe, I would say also for you, you know, if you're staying in touch with people right now, I like it when people are right to the point of what, <laughs> what they're doing. You know, I get these e rambling emails a lot of times like, uh, what do you want? You know, and I think <laughs> part of it is, hi, it's Chloe. I just wanted to check in and tell you. I'm graduating from USC. I'm starting to look around. I'm curious about what opportunities are in Sacramento. Could you take 10 minutes to get on the phone with me and just spend that time? Thanks again for doing that. You know, I'm just a big believer of being direct about that stuff. Or I just wanted to keep you posted that I'm graduating. I'm really excited. I'll let you know where I land, but thank you again for your great advice. You know, what, what do you, why do you want to keep that relationship? And um, I think that's important too, to keep people up to date. Um, I'll give the last question to Derek. Thank you, Nicole. Um, obviously, networking is very important um, and finding the right mentor also seems to be very important. What advice do you have for uh, choosing uh, the right mentor and making sure that you know you can trust them with the advice that they give you? Well, I would say, you know, if you, Derek, if you're in school here, I mean, USC should be able to help you find a good mentor. I don't know if you guys do a mentorship program or do anything like that. And a mentor can be having coffee with someone who has an interest in your background and issues and you touch base with them on, you know, on a regular basis. In our firm, it's a little more formalized. We meet every other week or we have, uh, we have people in our firm who have mentors outside of the firm that we have helped. We've asked p different people we think will be good connections because there's similarities in their history and their career or what they want to do or where they want to go. And so, um, you know, I think that's one thing to look at is what, what is it you can learn from so many people, so many things, but is there someone that's similar to what your career trajectory or what you want to do that might be helpful for you? Can, can USC help you with that? I mean, through the university, you know, and again, I would tell you that Sorrel program, we do other uh, leadership programs. That's a great way to kind of connect in and identify who those potential mentors could be. Uh, I agree. USC is an amazing resource for mentorship. Uh, you have Cami and, and his team and Nicole, and I mean, I'm sure they could connect you, Derek, with so many great people that can be mentors. Characteristics of a mentor, uh, finding someone that's respected, that's honest, that's going to really take the time to, to uh, be with you and give you advice and answer questions uh, and not choosing a mentor. I, I see this especially recently. Donna alluded to it earlier, recently, you know, politics has become so polarized. The polarization is amazing. You know, not picking a mentor based on ideology or, you know, oh, I need to find someone who's my mentor who agrees with me ideologically and, and is, agrees with me on every single issue. You don't want a mentor who's a, a echo chamber, right? So that you say, I believe in this. And he says, oh yeah, I do too. We're both great. We're both on the same side. You want someone who's gonna challenge you too and say, well, wait a minute you know, what about this viewpoint or what about that viewpoint? Or there's room for thoughtful dialogue about all issues and being open-minded. I think Donna used the phrase open-minded earlier, being open-minded, especially in this political environment we're in right now, which is a political environment that I've never seen before. I don't know, Donna, if, if you have, but I have never seen a political environment like this where when I was involved, got involved in politics, people are like, why are you getting involved in politics? What, you know, you're what? Now, everyone's political. Everything's political. Everyone's political. Everyone's got a strong uh, vociferous opinion, ideological opinion about every single issue. Great. It's great to be politically engaged. It, as long as uh, you and your mentor temper that with the right dose, I would say, as, of thoughtfulness and uh, intellectual curiosity and being able to, to vet out different people's viewpoints. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Okay, so we're really coming up on the hour here, so I want to be mindful of our uh, panelists' time. But I, before we go, I would love to get a picture of everyone. Um, so if you have your uh, camera off and can are in an area where you can turn it on, that would be amazing. And I'll take a couple pictures of us, um, and then we will thank our panelists so much. Uh, I, this was a great discussion. I, I learned a lot, so I know that the students did too. So thank you both so much for your time. We really, really appreciate it. And the advice, I'm like writing all of it down. So, um, but ready, we're gonna, uh, if you wanna throw up a fight on, that would be awesome. And if everyone could do that, and then I'm gonna take a couple just to be safe. Hold on one second. Okay, one, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, thank you so much.